Hello, my name is Taya Graham, and welcome to the Police Accountability Report. As I always make clear, this show has a single purpose, holding the politically powerful institution of policing accountable. And to do so, we don't just focus on the bad behavior of individual cops. Instead, we examine the system that makes bad policing possible. And today, we will achieve that goal by reporting on the arrest of a man who was accused of overstaying his welcome in a national park. But it's not just the overzealous park police that will be the focus of our story. Instead, we will report on how this arrest exemplifies an issue that does not get enough attention, how crime is perceived and how that perception shapes the behavior of law enforcement. But before we get started, I want you watching to know that if you have evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us and we might be able to investigate for you. Please reach out to us. You can email us tips privately at par at therealnews.com and share your evidence of police misconduct. You can also message us at Police Accountability Report on Facebook or Instagram or at Eyes on Police on Twitter. And of course, you can always message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Twitter or Facebook. And please like and comment. I really do read your comments and I appreciate them. And even if I don't get to respond to each one, I promise you, I have read them. And we also have a Patreon link pinned in the comments below. So if you feel inspired to donate, please do. We don't run ads or take corporate dollars. So anything you can spare is truly appreciated. Okay. We've gotten that out of the way. Now, if there is one fact about American policing that gets less attention than it deserves, it's just how much of it we have. I mean, Stephen and I have covered rural communities across the country where the balance between the amount of crime and the number of cops simply seems out of whack. And it's an imbalance that has real consequences. That's because many small communities spend a disproportionate share of their municipal resources on policing. And subsequently, those cops either feel pressured or better yet, empowered to make arrests that appear to have little to do with public safety. Which is why the video I'm showing you now is not just emblematic of that idea, but it's an incident that requires more in-depth reporting so we can better understand the consequences of over-policing and why our country is so apt to embrace it. The story starts at the Coconino National Forest in Flagstaff, Arizona. There, Steve Hedrick had been camping for roughly two weeks. Technically, he had reached the limit of time allowed inside the park, but with good reason. That's because he was working to clean up the park. In fact, as you can imagine, our much visited national lands are also unfortunately inundated with trash. Refuse that the federal government can't always remove, which means that citizens sometimes have to take the initiative to keep these valuable public resources as pristine as possible. So let's take a look at his first encounter with police. I like to be reasonable with people. Um, you know, I don't want to have to cut you a ticket for violating our 14 day stay limit, but, um, you know, I do see a lot of stuff around. I well, understand if, you're if, trying to clean stuff up, but if, if, if you could just get in touch with the volunteer coordinator, he could explain a lot. Of it. Um, uh, and now did he make a volunteer agreement or anything like that? With That's you? what we're drawing up right now. We, but we told him we we're out here picking up the trash anyway, which is, we, you see all this, this is mine right here. We just want the trailer over here because we need sun, a uh, landfill. To just dump it, because we've been going in there every day and dumping it. Okay, well, good deal. All right, so... Um, but can you call him? Because he might be able to verify some information. Yeah, well, so it, unless you have a valid uh, volunteer agreement or a special use permit, you have to abide by our 14-day okay. stay, stay limit, okay? You want me to pull up and leave? Yes, sir, I, I'd appreciate that, because we've had... A can you give me 24 hours or so? We, we've had several complaints. So here's several the deal. Complaints. Yeah, we actually have people from the highway on 66. Um, so here's the deal, right? I can be reasonable, but you just told me that you've been here for more than 14 days, and, and I can't, I can't say yes, you can go ahead and violate federal law by staying longer than that, okay? So I can't give you permission to do that, all right? But like many examples we have seen on the show, the country's law enforcement industrial complex is either unable or unwilling to discern how and when the law should be applied. That is, the overabundance of cops in even remote places like a federal park creates an imperative to make arrests, book stats, and create havoc for people who are no threat to public safety. And that is exactly what happened when the same park police returned. Let's watch. Hey, how's it going, sir? What's up? Hey, Officer Ryan. Hey, I've talked to you before, right? Yeah. Yeah, out here, right? Same spot? I think. Okay, and I gave you the same 
same kind of spiel I did as today that you got 14 days on the Coconino National right. Forest. As soon as I can get out of here, I will, but it's muddy. I can't, I'm not getting stuck. I can't that's, get stuck. That's, that's the only thing. Okay. It's that's so only expensive. Thing. All right, hey, stuck. come back. I'm not done with you. You got your ID on you, sir? I've already, you've already ID'd me. Okay, I need your ID again. No, please. please. Hey, go ahead. Turn around for me. Face away. No, I'm not doing anything wrong. Why are you giving me a hard time? Get on the ground. No. Get on the ground please, now. You are under you. arrest. Get on the ground. Can I, give you, can I give you his ID, sir? Get on the ground. Sir, please. Get on the ground. Hey, get on the ground. Get your hands off of Get on the ground. Inside. What are get you on the ground now. You are under arrest, ma'am. Get back. I'm for what? You're under arrest. Tell me for what? I want to speak to your supervisor. Inside. All right. I want to speak to your supervisor. Get on the ground now. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. You're going to get tased. Taser, taser, taser. What are you doing? Get on the ground, man. I want to speak to your supervisor. You will. No. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Now, it's worth noting that the police could not verify Steve's status as an official volunteer. It's also worth noting that he had been warned previously that he had technically overstayed his time in the park. But Steve says the police did not actually call the nonprofit because he helps run it, and the number goes right to his mobile phone. So that's how he knows the police never actually called. But the real question here is do the actions of Steve, who was demonstrably assisting in cleaning the area and who arguably had a case to say that his stay was warranted, deserve such a violent response? Did he deserve serious federal and state criminal charges? I mean, was what we saw in the video really necessary? Well, to get his side of the story, we're going to be talking to Steve Hedrick soon. But before we do, I'm joined by my reporting partner, Stephen Janis, who has been looking into the case and reaching out to the police for comment. Stephen, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So you've been reaching out to Park Police. What did they say about the arrest? Well, I haven't heard back from them yet. I did review the statement of probable cause, and it seems like they were using, you know, sort of Mr. Hedrick's behavior to justify the arrest, because technically, from what I can tell, the park rangers could just issue him a ticket and thus allow him to pay a fine. It didn't have to tase him and arrest him. So I don't see the justification in the statement of probable cause for that. I will keep reaching out to the agency. If I get an answer, I'll put it in the chat or post it later. Now, I know you also asked about the use of force report with regards to the arrest. What have you learned? If you look at the statement of probable cause, it's clear that the officer has a narrative there. And I, I think truly the narrative doesn't match what went on. And I don't think use of force was justified because you can't just use force for compliance, right? You can use force to protect yourself or to protect others. But just because someone is being annoying or not listening to what you're saying doesn't mean you can tase them. And I think that's what it was. It was just a matter of compliance where you see a police officer misconstruing the use of force as a way to get someone to do what they want them to do but not using it in the proper context, which is to protect people. And in this case, I think he just used it because he really, in the, in the statement of probable cause and the only records we have, just seemed pissed off and said, I'm going to tase you. And, and so I think it's a really questionable use of force. I mean, for God's sakes, they're in a park. The guy's just parked there. He's clearly cleaning stuff up. He's a veteran. I don't think there's any reason to tase him. And the documents I see give no justification where anyone's life was in danger. So it's very questionable. And finally, what are the regulations regarding the use of national parks? What does the law say and how should it be applied? Well, to be fair, it is a 14 day period where you're supposed to leave after 14 days. You can go for a week and come back and re-register. But you know, I think there were extenuating circumstances here. Um, you know. Mr. Hedrick said he was a volunteer. The police officer said he checked with the volunteer coordinator and they said he was not, but he runs his own nonprofit. I think it was a case where there's enough leeway where you could say, you know, let's come to an agreement here. We don't have to tase someone and humiliate him and arrest him, right? I mean, this is a problem with law enforcement. There are many other solutions to these problems that don't require force and violence. And I think that's what we see here. And that's the problem. It's an endemic of a larger and broader problem in the psychology of law enforcement. So now now we're joined by our guest, Steve Hedrick, to discuss his arrest. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate this. So first, tell me a little bit about your organization. Uh, what's its name and what do you do to clean up the national parks? We are a 501c3 that does nothing but clean public lands. I, I devised an app called Pin the Trash, which allowed anybody out in public to pin trash locations on public lands. This would allow us to do a volunteer response and come in there and clean those locations 
in the hopes of keeping the lands open. So tell me what happened when the officer first encountered you. It seemed you'd been there for a few days and you were working and the encounter seemed like it went well. So what happened next? Yes, I, I gave him my military ID uh, initially. Uh, I'm a disabled veteran. Then I, I turned around and he didn't recognize ID. So I asked for a regular ID. I, I gave him a, a state ID because I'm a resident of Arizona. Um, and uh, he, w he you could tell he was irritated with me about it. I didn't know at the time why, though. Now, please tell me about the second encounter, because it seems like things became very aggressive. Now, he knew who you were because he called you by name, but became very aggressive with you very quickly. He had he had come and approached my wife initially and asked to speak to me. So I came out of the tra uh, trailer. I was in there doing some work for Nomadic Management. That's the nonprofit. And uh, I walked out and I knew there was going to be a problem because he was he you could see the irritation on his face uh he was already mad because this was actually the third encounter i had with this officer they don't release the video of the of the second encounter but the the second encounter was the same thing he came by and bought and, and griped at me about having trash on the trailer I, I again tried to explain to him i'm trying to clean these forests to keep them open and he he again he was not happy about that on the second meeting on the third meeting, you can see he immediately uh, wanted my ID again. I was frustrated. I, I, you know, I had already ID'd myself clearly. He knew who I was. He knew, he knew I was out there cleaning these lands. He's upset about it for whatever reason. So nevertheless, I got frustrated and just threw my hands out and went after my ID anyway. I, and that's when he bum rushed me. And the attack began. So the officer then became physical with you and your wife. Can you tell us what happened next? Oh my gosh, my wife was so bruised up. Her arms were so bruised up. Uh, she's a little Jamaican girl, beautiful little Jamaican girl. And just, it, she, he bruised her arms up, pushed her around. Uh, we were lucky enough that there was a bystander there catching the, on camera too. You can see in the film where uh, two views of what's happening. That One of those views is from a bystander timed perfectly to it and uh it was it's so upsetting to see your wife of all people being pushed and, and there's nothing you can do this guy is just off the hook you know so didn't the officer taser you i mean it appears he tasered you and then pushed your wife what happened next and what did you end up being charged with yes he tased me and uh i pulled the initially i asked him for a supervisor i said please let me speak to a supervisor because i knew this was going to get out of hand because of his anger and his attitude. Uh, that's when, uh, with his anger and his attitude, I just, I, I, I didn't know what to do. You know, I, fr I'm frustrated, I'm cleaning the forest, I'm doing my best, and he tases me. I couldn't believe it, I'm in shock. The first thing I do is pull the taser out and ask for a supervisor. And he just bum rushes me again. It just continues, and, you know? And if you read the, well, you know, it's just crazy. I was charged with aggravated assault on an officer and uh, resisting arrest with physical force. On, that's one, that, that's just on state. I was also charged in federal for disobeying, what was it, disobeying an order of some sort and 14 day overstay of, of camping on public lands. So uh, I got charged in both courts. I, I, I talked to the attorney and he's, because he thought this might be double jeopardy, in fact, being charged in two different courts on, on, on similar charges. Uh, but in Flagstaff, I guess it's, uh, they do what they do. The, the truth of the matter is we're cleaning up the trash. The volunteer force is amazing. You can have volunteers coordinated through an app and they go right to the trash. They clean it up on their own time. There's hundreds of people that do this just voluntarily. So trash is not the main issue here. The fact of the matter is homelessness has increased exponentially in this community. It's, it's uh, and, and everywhere for that matter, you know, homelessness is everywhere. And, and, and they think that just because you're mobile, you're homeless and it makes for a big difference. Even if you're in a travel trailer, even if you're in a big class ARV, you can be in a van, you can be in a, a school bus for that matter. 
living and having a great life. You got all the amenities at home right there, but they consider you homeless and they come at you like that because they don't go after the homeless camps that are right there to run them off. And I wondered about that. I said, well, why don't they run off the homeless camps if, if this is such a problem? And they said, no, that's, that's not what they're trying to do. They want the, the trash to build up so they can close the lands completely. So what has the emotional impact been? I mean, you're a veteran who has now dedicated his life to helping preserve and take care of our environment. How has the officer's response affected you? I mean, how has this impacted you either emotionally or even financially? I'm, I'm a, a military guy, you know, army guy, and, uh, you know, I back the blue usually, and I still do for that matter. Uh, I just, the problem is there's bad cops out there just like any, in any other group. And the good cops aren't turning in the bad cops. And that's just the bottom line because this didn't have to happen. You know, none of this had to happen. I'll, if he wanted to cite me a ticket, write me a ticket if you want. You know, I, I'll go give it to the volunteer coordinators that I was working with and show them that, you know, I'm cleaning the lands. This guy gave me a ticket. Can you help me out here? You know, but that's not what he was trying to do. He was trying to prove a point. Like when he said, get down on the ground. He wanted me in that mud. He wanted to get me in that mud. That was his whole intention, just to embarrass me and humiliate me. Uh, about cleaning public lands and it, it just it's gone too far and, and it's it's gone a lot further than that honestly uh they i can't trust an officer now you know uh my when i see them white trucks pull up used to i would go out and greet them and hey, hey how you doing you know you know you know, be a greeter for them but now uh I close my doors and lock them and hope they don't knock on my door. Now, I wanted to take some time to discuss with you the idea I raised at the beginning of the show. To a certain extent, it's a concept that pretty much motivates the uncritical embrace of American policing and the continued spending to fund it. But it's also a notion that's worth examining in the light of the case we just reported on, particularly because it all revolves around a single idea. What is a crime really, and how should we respond to it while remaining basically a just society? I raise the idea of crime because of a recent experience I had confronting how it has been situated in the debate over the American criminal justice system. It happened when we posted on our Police Accountability Report Facebook page about a book Stephen wrote called This Dream Called Death. The book was written while Stephen was covering our city's experiment with zero tolerance policing. As I had mentioned in previous shows, Baltimore arrested almost 100,000 people per year for seven years. This in a town of 600,000 people. The strategy was an extension of the broken windows theory of policing, which argued cops could reduce violent crime by making arrests for minor infractions like spitting on a sidewalk or drinking a beer in public. And as I reported before, this strategy led to tens of thousands of illegal arrests and was not successful in reducing crime. In fact, the Justice Department found in an investigation that it was both unconstitutional and racist. So when Stephen decided to write a book about zero tolerance, he decided to answer the metaphor, so to speak, with another metaphor. In other words, he decided to take the idea of broken windows and turn it on its head. First, it's important to understand how the broken windows metaphor was used by its creators, sociologists James Q. Wilson and George L. Kelling. Their idea was that a neighborhood plagued by petty crimes was like a building in disrepair fix the broken windows or make petty arrests, the authors argued, and the broader problems of violent crime will drop. Of course, applying the metaphor exposed its flaws. I mean, how can you equate human behavior with the exterior of a building? Or better yet, how can you compare adding some paint and replacing some glass with putting a human being in a cage? And it was this metaphorical disconnect that Stephen decided to explore when he wrote the book. In it, he describes a world where the government tracked and punished people for their unconscious thoughts. The idea was to, in a sense, reveal the broader and less recognized impact on the psyches of people who could be detained, arrested, locked away, and prosecuted 
without cause. To explore and reveal how the ability to indiscriminately police space was actually a broader and more far-reaching attack on the mind itself. But the reason I bring the book up is what happened after we posted about it on Facebook, because soon after we did, with a similar explanation about its contents, we were overwhelmed with dozens of pro-police, you support criminals comments. The remarks were dismissive, insulting, and sometimes just dumb. But their message was extremely uniform. Holding police accountable is stupid, useless, and only helps lawbreakers. Questioning the power of law enforcement can only mean that you're a communist or a lib cuck or a criminal lover who just wants miscreants to get coddled. But the thing that struck me about so many of these comments was how it exactly proves the point of Stephen's book. It almost seemed like the people who were railing against the idea of putting checks on the unbridled power of law enforcement had, in their own way, been brainwashed. And it's not a phenomenon limited to our Facebook page. Over and over again, the mainstream media reports on crimes with singular abandon, while putting less emphasis on broader injustices. Our own Real News contributor, Adam Johnson, pointed this out in his excellent article on how the discovery of lead in the water system of the entire city of Chicago got less attention than a shoplifting case in San Francisco. So let me repeat that. A dangerous and health-threatening substance in the water of the third largest city in the country got less notice from the mainstream media than a single case of theft from a major corporation. Johnson used the example to make the point that crime and our perception of it is constructed by mainstream media narratives, an idea I agree with. But I think it goes further than that because I think this notion of what constitutes a crime and what doesn't goes far deeper into the political psyche of this country than we are often willing to admit. What I mean is that our idea of the reckless wanton criminal has a purpose. It's a way of creating a psychological boundary around our collective imagination to limit it by invoking fear, meaning the fear and uncertainty and division constructed by our idea of crime actually makes us more susceptible to irrational policies and rampant inequality by simply making us immune to reason. It's understandable to a certain degree. Safety is a pretty primal concept. No one wants to feel unsafe. And if we were constantly being overwhelmed by images that construct a world where we're never safe, well, it's not a surprise that so many people would make judgments based upon the fear that that perceived lack of safety engenders. I guess the best way to explain this is to think of our minds as rational immune systems, active and constant filters of information and sensory input that hopefully guides us towards the clearest path of a just and productive society. Taking that idea one step further, imagine if you wanted to impose a policy that was antithetical to that idea. Imagine if you wanted to profit off unfair wages or a corrupt system to enrich yourself. One would think that sort of destructive behavior would be harder to pull off in a democracy where citizens can vote in their own self-interest. I mean, how would anyone be able to create an economy where the top 1% owns more wealth than the bottom 40% if the people had the power to stop it. Well, it's a lot easier to pull off if you have this handy idea of crime. Just keep bombarding people with the notion that this country is a festering gang of criminals waiting to take everything you own, and eventually people will stop caring about good policy or fairness. I mean, keep fanning the flames of fear and mistrust, and pretty soon you can pretty much erode the rights of everyone and even earn their blessing to do so. That is what's so scary about the reaction I encountered to the idea of holding police accountable. People are so full of fear that they are willing to abandon the principles of being skeptical of unchecked power. They are so assured that crime is rampant. They are willing to give up their rights just to abate it. I mean, I live in one of the most violent and crime-ridden cities in the country. I myself have been a victim of multiple crimes. But I've also witnessed what happens when a city beset by fear unleashes the power of law enforcement without limits. And I can tell you how that works out. The cops become criminals and literally no one is safe. Let's remember 
If there is one unifying idea that describes our American Constitution, it's the skepticism of unchecked power. If there is one single basis for the individual rights enumerated in our basic body of laws, it is to protect us from the abuse of that power, which is why we can't let fear guide our policy. And we certainly can't give up the right to hold public officials accountable in exchange for making us safer. Just ask Baltimore City how well that worked out. What we can do though, is continue to fight for our rights, not to just stand on a sidewalk without an ID or even hang out in a park for longer than the law allows. No, what I mean is to continue to fight for the right to think freely to never let fear become the guiding light of our intellect, to maintain the vibrancy of our civic imagination, to conjure solutions to complex problems, and to allow us to demand, not just to preserve the rights which exist, but to seek out more. This is why the use of the idea of crime as a tool for paralyzing our critical thinking skills is just so troubling for me. Why I think we need to construct a more rational notion of what is crime and the best way to mitigate it. Because the current iteration means this, give up your liberty, your rights, and your ability to demand accountability, all for an elusive notion of safety behind an illusory blue wall. Well, I don't know about you, but it sounds like a really bad deal to me. I want to thank my guest, Steve Hedricks, for speaking with us today and for his efforts to keep our national parks clean. Thank you, Steve. And of course, I have to thank intrepid reporter Stephen Janis for his writing, research, and editing on this piece. Thank you, Stephen. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And I want to thank mods of the show, Noli D and Lacey R for their support. Thank you. And a very special thanks to our Patreons, especially super friends Shane Bushta, Pineapple Girl, and Code, and my new patron associate producers, Lewis and John Rowe. We appreciate you so much. And I look forward to thanking each and every one of my patrons personally in our next live stream. And I want you watching to know that if you have evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us and we might be able to investigate for you please reach out to us. You can email us tips privately at par at therealnews.com and share your evidence of police misconduct. You can also message us at Police Accountability Report on Facebook or Instagram or at Eyes on Police on Twitter. And of course, you can always message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Twitter or Facebook. And please like and comment. I do read your comments and I really appreciate them. And you taking the time to do them helps our work break through the algorithm and get out into the world. Oh, and we do have my Patreon link pinned in the comments below. So if you feel inspired to donate, please do. We don't run ads or take corporate dollars. So anything you can spare is greatly appreciated. My name is Taya Graham and I'm your host of the Police Accountability Report. Please be safe out there.